Welcome to The Waves, Slate's podcast about gender, feminism, and making men responsible for their sperm. Every episode, you get a new pair of feminists to talk about the thing we can't get off our minds. And today you've got me, Shayna Roth, senior producer here at Slate. This week, we're wading into the abortion argument again, but looking at it in a very different way. We're looking at it from a getting pregnant in the first place lens and how we shift the burden from women to men. Recently, I was thrilled to realize that my home state, Michigan, is not the red bastion the yard signs in my neighborhood would have had me believe. We passed a ballot measure that enshrines the right to an abortion in our state constitution, which is fantastic. Abortions should be legal. It's a medical procedure that politics really needs to stay the hell out of. But it also got me thinking, no one really wants to have an abortion. It's not a game that people are playing. No one has sex hoping that the experience will culminate in an abortion. It's what happens when there is an unwanted pregnancy. There's also medical reasons for abortions where the fetus is wanted but can't be carried. But we are focusing this episode on unwanted pregnancies. So if no one wants to have abortions to begin with, shouldn't we be doing more to prevent unwanted pregnancies? But when you start to think about it, the options that we have are very archaic and overwhelmingly focused on what women have to do to prevent pregnancies. Most birth control options are for women and can cause an array of side effects that run the gamut in severity from headaches to death. Enter Gabrielle Blair. Her new book, or maybe the better word for it is Manifesto, Ejaculate Responsibly, lists the radical yet logical reasons why men need to step up and be more responsible with their dangerous sperm. My conversation with Gabrielle Blair starts right after this short break. Hey, Waves listeners, if you're loving the show, and we really hope you are, you should subscribe to our feed. New episodes come out every Thursday morning. While you're there, check out our other episodes, too, like last week's where we spoke with actress and director Lake Bell about her fascination with voices. We've also talked about witches and Sarah Palin. And coming up after Thanksgiving, we'll have Taffy brodesser Ackner on to talk about her new Hulu series, Fleischman is in Trouble, Divorce, Middle Age, and more. You won't want to miss that. This episode of The Waves is brought to you by Cook Unity. Getting your food delivered is kind of like having a bad date. It sometimes happens late at night, it's never on time, it's usually not as hot as you hope, and it tends to leave you full of regret. Maybe it's time to break up with delivery and try something better. You could be inviting a different chef over every night with Cook Unity. With quality ingredients and hundreds of fresh, creative meals, you'll never have to resort to swiping again. You might even want to light candles. Sign up at cookunity.com slash breakupwithdelivery and get 50% off your first week with the code WAVES. Welcome back to The Waves. I'm joined now by Gabrielle Blair, author of Ejaculate Responsibly, A Whole New Way to Think About Abortion. Gabrielle, welcome to The Waves. Thank you, Shana. So glad to be here. I want to start with one of your main arguments that comes up time and again in the book, which is that men are fertile all the time and women are not. I think this is summed up really well with the dog poop versus rotten food analogy in your book. And the analogy goes that if there's a vandal leaving dog poop on your doorstep every day and a vandal leaving rotten food on your doorstep once a month, but you don't know when they're going to leave it, of course you're going to spend your time and energy trying to stop the first vandal because they are causing a problem for you every day versus once a month. It's not not a perfect (laughs) metaphor, um, but I was trying to point out um, the differences in fertility with men and women. Women's fertility, we think of it as this very regular thing. People talk about that it's this four-week cycle. Um, As soon as you your first visit to the OBGYN, you're told that your fertile day is two weeks after the start of your last period. And that's just like the common sense rule of thumb that everyone is told and taught. 
Um, and none of it's true. Like the more research they do, the more they, they being the researchers, have discovered that no matter how regular your period is, your ovulation won't necessarily be, be regular, won't necessarily come at the same time. That it can really come any time within a 10-day period, no matter how how consistent your cycle is. Your ovulation day doesn't remain consistent, even if your start and your end of your period does remain consistent. Very unpredictable thing. And then you compare that to male fertility, is it's that daily, relentless bag of dog poop. It's there all the time. From the moment they hit puberty until they die, they are fertile. A fertile man is fertile every single day of their life. And there's no break in that. And, and we totally ignore it. Like we have an $8 billion birth control industry and 90% of the products are for women or paid for by women. We offer almost no energy or attention or funding to male birth control options because we just don't even really consider their fertility when we're having these conversations. You know, the more you think about it and the more you study it, the more bizarre it is. Like we have this constant relentless fertility that's causing so many problems And we're over here totally focused on like how to guess when this 24 hours of fertility is going to happen for women. It's super bizarre. It's super bizarre that this is how we've decided to to approach this whole system. And I get it. I mean, until pretty recently in the history of mankind, we could not prove who the father of a baby was. There was no way to prove that. At any time, a man could say, I don't claim this child and walk away even if the child looks identical to the man, until we have paternity tests, which again are very recent invention in our history. And so I get that the focus has been on women. And it's also like physically you can see it's happening to women. Like I get it. But now that we know who the fathers are and now that it's easy to to see who the fathers are and now that we have all these options for preventing pregnancy, it doesn't make sense that we're still so laser focused on trying to control women's unpredictable fertility and entirely ignoring men's totally predictable fertility. The big way that we require sort of women to take responsibility for this, for their fertility, is birth control. And you talk in your book about the myth that female birth control is easy to get. And and it, it is to an extent for privileged women, but for a lot of others, it is extremely difficult. So can you read this section in your book in which you describe some of the stuff that you have to do in order to get birth control. So all you have to do is find a healthcare provider who is taking new patients, have health insurance, wait six weeks for the next available appointment, come up with money for the copay, take off work, miss school, or find childcare to attend the appointment, and then lay on the exam table with your legs in stirrups while the doctor explores your most sensitive parts with cold metal medical tools. And after that, you'll need to find a pharmacy and stand in line for 45 minutes to fill your prescription. And that doesn't even get into the side effects that various types of birth control can cause, up to and including stroke, death. And as I read all of that in your book, I I kind of went, well, shit, (laughs) I have done all of those things. And it never really even occurred to me to be mad about it. I mean, I just I never really stopped and thought about how grossly unfair it was that I had to not only deal with these things to get birth control, but that I was putting myself at risk for all of those different side effects. And that's one of the things that I think is just so huge about the book and about your argument is that we don't even realize as women that we should be really pissed off. I feel angry at men as I as I think about these things. And I think this isn't fair. You're not doing your part. I'm not, I'm doing all this daily work, not to manage my fertility, but to manage your fertility. I'm only fertile 24 hours a month. I'm taking a pill every single day or absorbing hormones or dealing with side effects from an IUD or whatever it is every single day for the man's fertility, not for my fertility. So of course I should be angry. And I don't know of a single boyfriend that's ever offered to pay for half of the birth control that his girlfriend is taking. Like the women are having to deal with all of this. And so it it does, it makes me feel angry. And then I go, but men aren't taught any other way and women aren't taught any other way. So I can't even really be angry because it's not like I wake up every day thinking, oh, I've got to share the, the burden of birth control with my spouse. Like I wrote this stuff down, wrote these ideas down four years ago. At that point, 
We'd been married 23 years, had had six kids. Our youngest was nine years old. My husband had had a vasectomy nine years before. And this is the first time these ideas are occurring to me. So how can I be mad at men when women have also absorbed all this stuff? You know, like we assume we'll do the work of pregnancy prevention. So why would we be mad at men when they assume we'll do the work of pregnancy prevention? Like this is a cultural thing that we've all been taught, that we've all assumed. So it makes you angry. And then I have to go like, look, I can't even be angry about it. I just have to change the conversation. And a major role in how we think about pregnancy and abortion is linked to how we think about women's pain. You have a lot of really interesting uh, facts and examples in the book about how painful a lot of these methods of birth control can be for women. And you point out that an IUD placement is done without anesthetic and usually with little more than maybe an ibuprofen. Uh, But a vasectomy, arguably a less painful procedure, is done with a lot of pain-relieving measures. And then, and this is what I found very interesting, there's the history of Viagra, where early research and testing on it could have also been used to relieve menstrual pain. And they just didn't go in that direction because women's pain is just not a priority. Right. They literally, you know, they have this choice in front of them, in front of them. Should we fund the research that helps older men, not even all older men, but some older men have erections, or should we fund the research that um, gives really effective pain relief to women experiencing menstrual, menstrual cramps, which affects, you know, 50% arguably of the world's population. And People will say, well, of course they chose the men because they want to go where the money is. And even that doesn't make sense to me. Women have money too. <laughs> yeah, like, you think women aren't spending money on this stuff? Again, I, I've, I've mentioned an $8 billion birth control industry funded by purchases made by women. And you don't think we would buy effective pain control for, our, for menstrual cramps? It, it's just, I don't think it was a decision about the money. I think it's a decision about disregarding women's physical experiences and women's physical pain. And this committee that decided not to fund this research said outright they did not see it as a public health crisis. And you're like, of course you don't see it as a public health crisis. You know nothing about periods. You know nothing about menstruation. You don't don't talk to women about it. You don't want to hear about it. You want to absolutely ignore it and pretend it doesn't happen. It seems like this really shines a spotlight on the problem in particularly the health industry where there's just too many men at the top. Too many men making these decisions. There's not enough women that are at the table to step in and say, let me tell you, there are more women out there dealing with menstrual cramps than there are old men dealing with erectile dysfunction. It's a huge problem. Um, I see it more and more um, the more I talk to women about perimenopause and menopause. It's, it's the same sort of thing. You think we should have more knowledge about this than almost any other thing that happens to a human body because it happens to, you know, 50% of the whole population of the earth, right? And we know almost nothing. So not only do we have no medical research, which would be so easy to gather, right? We have, we can gather it from billions and billions of people. Not only do we not have that, we're not really allowed to talk about it. Like these conversations just get shut down. No one wants to know about it because it involves aging. And of course we worship the young. And I mean, for a, a myriad of reasons, it's all just really disturbing. But the medical approach to women's uh, pain, what they're going through physically is has been horrible and is very much lacking. And um, it's going to be a long time until we're caught up in any real way. Let's dig into the abortion side of all of this. I mean, there's the obvious math here of Reducing irresponsible ejaculation reduces the number of unwanted pregnancies, which reduces the number of abortions. And what I think might surprise people is that the talking point that abortion and adoption is sort of an either or decision is is completely false. It's just not true. Women that would consider adoption haven't considered abortion. It's just it's like it's like in totally different groups. If you get talked out of the abortion, that means you're going to have the baby and raise the baby. The idea that we want to associate the two, you know, that adoption is some sort of alternative, in practice, it just isn't for many reasons. But regardless of those reasons, it's just not. So we need to stop 
considering it. We need, we need to stop even bringing up adoption as part of this conversation because it's just not connected in any way. I mean, it really negates the fact that if you are going to give up a child for adoption, you have to go through the pregnancy and what that does to women's bodies, to their hormones for the rest of their lives. I mean, you mentioned in the book just how pregnancy just completely changes a woman's body and sometimes can be life threatening. I've gone through six pregnancies. And if someone was to ask me, you know, oh, did you have major physical changes from a pregnancy? My in fact, I've had these conversations. My initial reaction, my first, you know, gut response is like, oh, no, my pregnancies were fine, totally normal. But, you know, like that's – and that's what I've answered before. But, of course, if I think about it, I'm like, oh, no, I have – definite scars and definite changes to my body that I've just accepted as a fact of pregnancy, a fact of this is just how it works. So I don't even count them. I don't even count them. But since I didn't almost die, then I guess those things don't count at all. Do you think men would be okay with saying, hey, every time I now, you know, jump during sports, anytime I sneeze or cough, I pee? Like, do you think they, they're they okay with that? No. And we just say, well, do some Kegels. Hopefully you'll get better. Like, like we, we don't treat these as actual problems, as me- medical problems. And going back to the adoption thing, the whole idea that like, hey, this is just a simple solution. You don't want to have, you don't want to raise a child. Just go ahead and put the child up for adoption is so messed up. Yes, it totally disregards this physical ask, which is, it's so hard to express someone to someone what a physical ask this is unless you like dive into this into the statistics because as a culture we just only talk about pregnancy as this joyful um time and and, and I I get it because if we really talked honestly about it I don't think people would have babies like it would be I horrifying. mean horrifying you yeah. just wouldn't want to no yeah I think there's just really some sort of protective instinct that doesn't let us talk honestly about childbirth, about child rearing even, um, or a lot less people would do it. And so there, you know, maybe there's just something in us, some evolutionary, something that says, don't talk about this, just have the babies. We're going to take a break here. But if you want to hear more from Gabrielle and myself on another topic, check out our Slate Plus segment. Today, we're going to talk about how the Pope is responsible for the way we take birth control pills. And please consider supporting the show by joining Slate Plus. Members get benefits like zero ads on any Slate podcast and bonus content of shows like this one. To learn more, go to slate.com slash the waves plus. This episode of The Waves is brought to you by Issue. First impressions are everything. So if you're looking to make an impact with your online content, you need Issue. The easiest way to make your creative ideas come to life and share engaging content everywhere you want to be seen. Issue is the all-in-one platform to create and distribute beautiful digital content from marketing materials and magazines to catalogs and portfolios and so much more. They really do it all. There's no need for endless scrolling through PDFs. Issue features your digital content in an easy to view way on every device. It also works seamlessly with the tools you already use and love like Canva, Dropbox, MailChimp, and InDesign. And you can start using Issue for free. Try it out and explore premium features that offer a more customized experience. Get started with Issue today for free or sign up for an annual premium account and get 50% off when you go to issue.com slash podcast and use promo code WAVES. That's I-S-S-U-U dot com slash podcast and use promo code WAVES at checkout for your free starter account or 50% off an annual premium account. That's issue.com slash podcast with promo code WAVES. This episode of The Waves is brought to you by Amazon Music. Actress, singer, entrepreneur, and your favorite Virgo, Kiki Palmer, has a hilarious new podcast called Baby, This is Kiki Palmer on Amazon Music, and you're going to want to check it out. 
Kiki has a lot of burning questions that keep her up at night, don't we all? For instance, remember Tom from MySpace? Remember that guy with the smile and that little white t-shirt? What happened to him? She's putting friends, family, and some of the hottest experts in the hot seat to ask them the real questions we want to know. Like, is OnlyFans only bad? How has dating changed in the digital age? Where would former child stars be if they weren't actors? These are the questions running through Kiki's mind, and she's letting us in on it all. Because on Baby, This is Kiki Palmer, no topic is off limits. Listen to Baby, This is Kiki Palmer exclusively on Amazon Music. Download the Amazon Music app now. Welcome back to The Waves. I'm here with Gabrielle Blair, author of Ejaculate Responsibly, A Whole New Way to Think About Abortion. Gabrielle, I want to dig into your background just a little bit. You started out as one of the first mom bloggers in 2006, and your first book, Design Mom, came out in 2015. The New York Times had a great recent profile of you, and it called your book The Design Mom. Quote, a room-by-room guide to living with children featuring aspirational photography, tips for decluttering a mudroom, and gentle reminders not to skew too highbrow in the Lego phase of life. And I don't know if your new book, which is definitely more of a manifesto than a guide, uh, could be really further from that (laughs) book. So how did you go from design mom to ejaculation warrior? Well, I mean, for me, the same part of my brain that solves design problems, like I I think of design as problem solving. That's just how my brain approaches it and always has. So as I'm figuring out a solution, I'm, it's like an equation, you know, how, here's the budget we have, here's the space, the restrictions, how do I solve this in a way that will be both beautiful and functional and, you know, work for the family or whatever. So um, that same part of my brain also works on any other problems I encounter, you know, so my brain is considered a problem when I saw the number of abortions, like I had never looked up the number of abortions. This would have been back in 2018. I must have read some article or something and saw the number of abortions and was like, it was higher than I thought it was going to be. I don't know what number I had in my head, but it was just higher. And um, I started thinking about, you know, um, why that would be and why wouldn't w- women prefer to be on birth control versus go through this gynecological procedure of an abortion, which I know women, I mean, we dread even getting a pap smear. It's not like we're like, you know, wouldn't be super excited for any gynecological examination or appointment or procedure. And so it wasn't like making sense to me. And then as I was, of course, as I thought about uh, birth control for women, I could instantly see the problem because it seems like I wouldn't know anything about birth control because I have six kids. So it seems like I would probably be like a novice to birth control, but I've actually used like every kind that's available. Um, I feel like I'm an expert. Um, I got to choose when I Um, had my babies, which is amazing. That's like an ideal situation, right? That you get to pause having babies when you want to and that the birth control works for you. And then you get to have the babies when you want to. Like that's obviously seemed like how it should work. I know how hard it is to use birth control. Like I've tried every kind. I had huge side effect issues with all of them that really were untenable. That's why I had to try the next one, try the next one. And beyond the side effects, here I had all these little kids and I'm going through the effort of trying to maintain my prescription and go to my yearly exams and all that, it, it, I found it really, really difficult to do what should be a very simple thing, but makes it so much harder when you're someone with young children or a job or whatever it is, a full life, trying to make time to troubleshoot birth control with your doctor and get appointments and make sure your insurance covering it and all, you know, all the things. I found all of that really, really difficult as well. And so it was really clear to me why a woman might not be on birth control and might need to get an abortion. And then, of course, I started thinking about men's role in all this and wrote my ideas down. (laughs) You're a Mormon mother. And I think when a lot of people hear Mormon, they think super conservative, probably quiet. Uh, They definitely don't expect someone to write 28 points on why men need to be more responsible about their sperm. So what has the reaction been like for you, particularly within the Mormon community? It's been, I want to say, largely positive. So this book is new, but the ideas and me putting them out in the world is not new. I first put them out as a a Twitter thread or, or parts of this out as a Twitter thread in 2018. So I've been dealing with reactions from Mormons for 
a long time about this. And um, in general, it's positive. And I, I mean, my inbox, is, I get messages every day um, in DMs and my, my inbox everywhere that, you know, someone saying, hey, I'm a young Mormon mom. This really spoke to me. I, I'm feeling guilty. I want my husband to get a vasectomy, but like, feel like I have to somehow protect his manhood. And, you know, and just feels like that this book has empowered them to, to um, have those discussions with their spouse. And I, I think that's amazing. I also hear from um, Mormon, typically Mormon men, always anonymous, who who think that I'm I, I want to say not Mormoning correctly that they that I'm not that I'm not representing them the way they want they want me to, and that does not bother me at all because well they're wrong. <laughs> so I, I can easily say to them, please point out anything in the book, anything in the book that you feel is. Uh, goes against Mormon doctrine. There's just nothing there for them to be mad about. Really, if they're mad, they're just mad because they know I'm uh, pro-choice and I'm a Democrat and they don't like that. So, and, and, and honestly, I use my Mormonism as a tool where I can, meaning I know people are going to make assumptions. I can rely on those assumptions and use them to my benefit. And so that I do, meaning um, I know if I introduce myself as a religious mother of six or a Mormon mother of six, that people who won't agree with me politically may be willing to listen to me about this topic. And that's what I want them to do. And it has worked. I've, I've had wonderful feedback from people who um, have sent me messages saying, hey, I gave this book to my very conservative um, sister-in-law, and she was kind of hesitant to read it. She kind of read it begrudgingly. But then she came back and said, I agree with everything in the book. Like, and this is someone who, you know, doesn't agree with her sister-in-law politically, but they can agree on this. If I am using my Mormonism as, if I'm kind of being manipulative by mentioning my Mormon, Mormonism, that's fine by me. If it gets more men to ejaculate responsibly, then that's fine by me. And that's what I think is just so smart about the book is, I mean, right away at the beginning, you say, I'm not even going to dig into whether or not I am pro choice or anti-abortion because this conversation, while it affects abortion, it's not about whether or not abortion itself is okay. It's about erasing the need for abortion, which I think is just a super smart way to shift this discussion. However, ejaculate is not a sexy word. <laughs> and that's been pointed out in several articles on the book. And and really trying to get men to take on full responsibility for what they do with their sperm. I mean, it sounds like it should be a no-brainer, but it is a massive mind shift for a ton of people, for culture at large. How do we accomplish this? How do we get men to ejaculate responsibly? And along with that, how do we get women to stop having to shoulder so much of the burden of this conversation? I mean, I love these questions. This is what I think about all the time. Um, there is a section at the back of the book where I start saying like, hey, here's how we take action. This is what we can do. And um, and I think about, I try and think about other social movements that I've seen in my lifetime. Seatbelts, um, I remember so distinctly, I was 16 years old. I had just gotten my driver's license. And at the same time, they were just introducing seatbelt laws in my state. And I remember very clearly that I was never going to wear a seatbelt. What a dumb thing. I hadn't grown up with seatbelts. And then it was spring break and um, some kids came down from the big city and we're all like joy riding around town and they would not go. They would not budge until we all put on our seatbelts. And it was this instant change for me where I was like, oh, well, these are the cool kids from the big city and they're wearing seatbelts. So actually, I'm always going to wear a seatbelt. Actually, seatbelts are cool. Like it was this very, you know, peer pressure thing for 16 year old me and it worked, that uh, change of heart that I was having was happening on an individual basis to every other 16-year-old in the country or, you know, whatever, as their state made laws. Um, and not just to 16-year-olds, but to everybody. It took it took some time and it took some laws, but now everyone wears their seatbelt. No one has ever, in, in the last 20 years, no one has said to me, are you going to wear your seatbelt? As I get into the car. Like, it's just not even a thing, right? Like it's, and, and it's just an assumption. And I can see a future, or I can, you know, picture a future where no one has to say, are you going to ejaculate responsibly? That it's just an assumption that they, they have a vasectomy or they know how to use condoms very well. 
or there's a new birth control for men that's been developed or whatever it is that it's just like, yes, of course, I would never put my partner at risk. Of course, I'm going to ejaculate responsibly. I don't want to put my partner at risk. I don't want to risk disease. I don't want to put myself at risk and become a father when I'm not ready. Like, I would never ejaculate irresponsibly. Why would you even suggest such a thing? Who would ever be that dumb? Like, I think that's where we need to to be. And maybe it really is going to be a series of individual conversations, um, just like me and my seatbelts. But that can happen. And so what I really am asking of men is to talk about this. So, if, you know, if they've found a condom that they're like, oh, this is the best condom, it's new or it's thinner, or I like the, the lubrication technique or, you know, whatever it is, talk about this because I can talk about it all day long, but I don't have a penis. So giving condom advice is not going to be um, a strong point for me. But if a man who 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 has sex and uses a condom that he likes and says, no, it's great, that's going to be a much more convincing um, argument than I can offer. And the same with vasectomies. Like if you've had a vasectomy and it has improved your sex life, taken the burden off your wife. So she's no longer experiencing side effects. She doesn't want to affect or, you know, doesn't want to experience or, or whatever it might be. Tell your friends if your healing from it was easy, if your insurance covered it, you know, all these benefits. Talk about this stuff because there's definitely part of our culture where it's considered like some sort of conquest to be able to like have sex without a condom, that not having a vasectomy was somehow more manly or, you know, there, there's these weird myths and stigmas and men really have to overcome these. I, I can talk about it all day long, but men are the ones that need to say, that's wrong. That's a myth. You can have great sex with condoms. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. That has to come from men to other men. But I think we can shift the conversation because what, based on what I've seen, Men are actually very receptive to this. If they read this at all, and, you know, it's hard to resist the cover. It's hard to resist the title. They kind of know it's for them. Like when men see it, like who's ejaculating? Great. This is for me. And they, and they maybe even want to argue with it. What do you mean ejaculate responsibly? What does that mean? You know, like, and they might, they might want to argue with it, but then you get into it, even a few arguments and you're like, oh yeah, okay. This makes sense. Like there's not... Because what are they going to argue? Men should ejaculate irresponsibly. There's not, a, you know, there's not really a place to go with that argument, right? There's not like to say, nope, men should just be irresponsible. Like that's not going to be ever be a winning argument. So I really think we can get men to embrace this. And I've seen it happen. And so that probably is what encourages me as well. Gabrielle Blair is the author of Ejaculate Responsibly, A Whole New Way to Think About Abortion. It is out now. And when you get a copy for yourself, make sure you also send a copy to a justice on the Supreme Court. Gabrielle has a whole campaign on her website that we will link to in the show notes that will help you send a copy to a justice, especially one that voted to overturn Roe. At last count, uh, Amy Coney Barrett had the most copies sent to her with 24 Gabrielle, thank you again so much for joining us on The Waves. Thank you. This has been a lot of fun. That's our show this week. The Waves is produced by myself, Shayna Roth. Daisy Rosario is our senior supervising producer of audio here at Slate, and Alicia Montgomery is vice president of audio at Slate. We would absolutely love to hear from you. Email us at thewaves at slate.com. The Waves will be back next week. Different hosts, different topic, same time and place. 